Okay, first we're gonna look at carbohydrates. So carbohydrates um, has this kind of special chemical formula where carbon to hydrogen to oxygen ratio is one to two to one. So normally you can write the chemical formula for carbohydrates as CH2O with this N, sorry, N could be any number. For example, most of the uh, sugar molecules that we know, like glucose, fructose, N equals six, right? So if you put in the six, so that means their chemical formula is C6H2 multiplied by six, that's 12, right? O6. So that's the chemical formula for glucose and for some of the other common six carbon sugars. Again, you know, fructose, uh, galactose, they all have this chemical formula. So I need you to remember this because Peace does mention that you need to know glucose and the chemical formula, just in case. Examples for carbohydrates, sugars, right? Like all those simple sugars I mentioned, and also some of the uh, complex carbohydrates, starch, right? and also fibers. So fibers are also carbohydrates. So you probably never thought about the fact that simple sugars and starch and fibers, they're actually the same type of micromolecule, but they are, they're all carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates have this kind of critical function. So they are used as uh, energy storage. Our body obtains energy from carbohydrates in the food, and then our body can also store um, excess energy in the form of carbohydrates. Okay? So why carbohydrates are so critical for energy source? And that's because the carbon-hydrogen bond uh, called, it, it's a type of chemical bond called a covalent bond, but you probably don't know what it is yet. We'll talk about this in a later lesson. Just know that the carbon-hydrogen bond can hold a lot of energy. And carbohydrates molecules, those molecules have a lot of carbon-hydrogen bond. So that's why carbohydrates are perfect uh, molecules for storing energy. So when we eat, right, we get carbohydrates from food and our body breaks down carbohydrates and the energy in the carbon-hydrogen covalent bond will be released. And this is how we get our energy right, every day because we need about 2000 calories of you know, energy every day. And also if we uh, have excess energy, right, we are going to store those energy in carbohydrate molecules. And there's a very important one. Um, in the liver, our body stores glucose, excess glucose in the form of glycogen, right? So glycogen is a type of carbohydrate. It's actually a polymer because it's made up of many, many glucose molecules. Right? Now, carbohydrates can be classified as monosaccharide, disaccharide, and polysaccharide. So mono, mono means one, right? So single sugar units, such as glucose, fructose, those are monosaccharide. Disaccharide, di means two, right? So that's when the molecule is made up of two monosaccharides. Polysaccharide, poly means the many. So Polysaccharide molecules usually have many monosaccharides in the structure. Okay. We also have oligosaccharides. Now, oligosaccharides, oligo means there are a few, but not too many. So oligosaccharides have a small number of monosaccharides in the structure, usually you know, from three to 10 monosaccharides. So you can see it's a small number. So oligosaccharides are not a very big carbohydrates. Usually oligosaccharides can be found in cell surface. So usually they can be found in cell surface. And they're used in the cell recognition process, for example, you know, these oligosaccharides can be used as cell markers, right? Um, and then they can be used um, for other cells to identify whether this particular cell is a self cell or uh, it's a, a foreign cell. So it's used for cell recognition. Okay, now monosaccharide, where they talk about some of the common ones, uh, glucose, fructose, 
they're just one single sugar subunit, right? So they contain six carbons. Uh, for, in the case of glucose, it's very important in energy storage. And uh, I want to mention this again, because this is important. The cell needs glucose as energy source. So a cell has to be able to take in glucose from the blood, right? And the, the process of taking up glucose into the cell is regulated by insulin. Okay, so that's why insulin is so important. If you don't have enough insulin, or if uh, your cells' uh, sensitivity to insulin is going down, then the cells are going to have trouble taking in glucose from the blood. So those patients tend to have um, high blood, oops, blood sugar level, right? Basically, those patients are diabetic. Okay, now um, other monosaccharides include fructose and galactose. Now you may think, mm, I don't, I'm not familiar with those two. Do we actually use them in our daily life? And the answer is yes. When we get to the uh, disaccharides, you will see they're actually pretty common. Um, disaccharide, like I said, di means two, right? So these disaccharide molecules have two monosaccharides joined together by when you need to make from small to big, it's dehydration, right? Or condensation synthesis. Okay. Now these disaccharides have similar functions, right? They use for sugar transport, they store energy. Some good examples are sucrose. So sucrose is right here. That's the common sugar that we use for cooking, for baking. And you can see sucrose has two monosaccharides linked together, right? So we have a glucose, we also have a fructose, okay? So you actually probably um, ingest a lot of fructose, right? If you cook a lot, use sugar, uh, or if you bake a lot, use sugar because fructose makes up half of the sucrose, right? The, the table sugar that you use. Um, a second example of disaccharide is lactose. So that's commonly known as the milk sugar. So milk, even though it doesn't taste very sweet, it does have a sugar. And that sugar is in the form of a disaccharide, which is lactose. Right? Anything that has O-S-E, it's probably a sugar, some kind of some type of sugar. So lactose is made up of one glucose molecule, one glucose and one the lactose. There you go. So if you drink milk every day, or if you like to eat ice cream, you are also taking in a lot of the lactose through uh, ice cream or milk. Okay. Now a lot of people are lactose intolerant. Why is that? Now, the saccharides should be digested and, and broken down to monosaccharides in our body. But if somebody is lacking in the enzyme that can break down lactose to their uh, respective monosaccharides, right, which is glucose and Lactose. If somebody doesn't have that enzyme to break down lactose, then the lactose will remain this kind of bigger disaccharide molecules, right? And that will kind of cause some of the uh, GI tract symptoms. So if the, the person doesn't have the enzyme, then that person is lactose intolerant because the person's body cannot break down lactose, right? But um, I think there are some um, better products that are uh, available for people who are lactose intolerant. Uh, those products either have the enzyme added or uh, lactose has been removed from those products. So people who are lactose intolerant can uh, enjoy those uh, products. Maltose is another common example of a disaccharide. When we digest starch in our mouth by the uh, amylase in our saliva, right? 
the amylase actually digests starch to disaccharide first. So that disaccharide is maltose. Okay, now polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are much bigger now, right, than mono or disaccharides. So there are long chains of sugars, and those sugars are the monosaccharide, or they're the monomer. Now, because polysaccharides are much bigger, usually they're water insoluble. For example, if you put starch in water, uh, you can see the starch molecules will kind of settle down at the bottom. And that's because they're relatively insoluble in water, just because how big they are. Now, these polysac polysaccharides are ideal storage products, right, for storing uh, the monosaccharides, which are basically the energy source for cells. Now, talking about energy storage, remember that plants and animals are going to use a different types of polysaccharides to store energy. Plants use starch, right? When you eat potatoes, switch, uh, sweet potatoes, uh, rice, uh, wheat products, those products have a lot of starch, right? And then those products are produced by plants. So plants will store any excess glucose in the form of starch. Animals are going to use a different product, which I mentioned earlier, glycogen. We usually store excess glucose in glycogen, which is mainly found in the liver and muscles. Right? When our blood sugar level is low, when we need to have glucose in the blood, we will break down glycogen in the liver and muscles to kind of mobilize the glucose molecules. Right? So um, there are some polysaccharides that, um, that are made for structural support. For example, plants use cellulose. So think about the, you know, when you chew salaries, you know, there's some kind of big fibers in the salary that, you know, no matter how long you chew, it's kind of hard to break down, right? So cellulose. Cellulose is also an important component in the cell wall of plants. Remember, plants have cell walls, but animals, animal cells do not have a cell wall. So for plants, cellulose is an important component in the cell wall. And that's kind of what makes the cell wall very rigid, very rigid. That's kind of thanks to the cellulose in the cell wall. Animals also use polysaccharides for structural support. Uh, and that polysaccharide is chitin. So you probably have seen pictures, or if you, if you, you have eaten uh, crawfish or lobsters, right? Those shells actually contain chitin, a polysaccharide. And the chitin is part of the, the bigger complex that makes up the shells, right? And then that's kind of very hard, very tough structure. It provides a structural support. So here is a diagram kind of showing you the structural, the structures of some of the common polysaccharides. So you can see the first one is starch, right? So starch actually has two components, amylose. Uh, remember amylose, amylose is broken down by amylase, right, in our mouth. Um, the second component, which is a branched structure, is called an amylopectin. This is the second component in starch. Okay. And the second polysaccharide, the glycogen, so you can see this is what glycogen looks like. Now, one thing I want to mention is that some of the polysaccharides have this linear structure. For example, amylose or cellulose, so you can see this is a linear structure, but others can be branched. For example, amylopectin and glycogen, highly branched. And this has some advantages, right? For example, glycogen. When we need to break down glycogen to release glucose, um, that's usually when the blood sugar level is low, right? And then we want to return the blood sugar level to normal. And we need to do this relatively fast, right? So what happens is we're going to break down the chemical bond and release the Glucose, right? We want to release the glucose. Now, the more branches we have, the faster we can release glucose, right? Because, you know, each branch will release this glucose 
and the end, right? So the more branches you have, then each time you can release more glucose molecules. So this is going to make the process, the breakdown process go much, much faster. So that's why, you know, the glycogen is a highly branched. But for structural support, you want to have this linear structure, right? So it's more packed, it's more sturdy. Uh, for example, cellulose, right? Fibers are usually pretty tough. Okay, now foods that have a lot of carbohydrates. Uh, these are potatoes, rice, bread, pasta, uh, and also foods containing simple sugars, right? Because the simple sugars are also part of the carbohydrate group. 